Welcome to the Impunity Observer monthly live stream. I'm your host, Fergus Hodgson, the managing editor of the Impunity Observer. Impunity Observer. We are a geopolitical intelligence service and we focus on the nexus of Latin and Anglo-America, seeking to align Latino and, Amer and American or US interests. And it's, it's my pleasure to be with you. Go to impunityobserver.com for all our content. Please follow us on all our social media feeds, whether it's Telegram, Twitter, Facebook. We're active on many platforms and you can, and you can get real-time updates. Telegram is my favorite. Okay, and these monthly live streams are a chance for Steve Hecht, our editor-at-large and founder, and I, to catch up and just chat about the work we've been doing, the insights that have come forward, and it is a, a, a yeah, it's a pleasure to do these. So, Steve, welcome uh, back. I'm glad to chat with you. And would you like to tell us? I mean, you've written two important articles this month. One is about the anti-socialism resolution in the U.S. Congress, U.S. House, and I'm not I, as far as I know, there was not one in the Senate, but. Would you like to, and this is the first article you wrote in, in earlier on in February, would you like to tell us why that is significant? Why, even though it's, a, let's say, a toothless resolution, why it is meaningful? Sure, Fergus. Uh, great to be with you again in this format. And um, that resolution is significant because 109 Democrats voted for it. And it condemns the horrors of socialism. That's what it's called, the horrors of socialism. And the only thing the resolution says is, is exactly that. Now, what do those Democrats think that the Biden administration is? Obviously, they believe that the Biden administration is not socialist. But the key element of socialism is you have to fool people into believing that they can get things that the government can't give them. And so when you, when you try to do that, you're really trying to impose a minority view on the majority. And so that requires politicized justice. So the hallmark of socialism is not freedom. It's, it's tyranny. In other words, uh, there's no uh, due process and uh, the justice system is, is arbitrary. And that's exactly where the Biden administration is going. And so if the Democrats, 109 Democrats, uh, can understand that, if the, if the Republicans can show that the Biden administration has weaponized the government, which the, uh, uh, the Democrats don't like that too much, but if they can show that, then where can the Democrats go? What can they say? Would you prove that the Biden regime is pushing socialism the Democrats are going to have to uh, 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 agree. They're going to have to change their tune. Uh, or uh, then the only thing left is to just simply uh, defeat them, which is very difficult to do. Yeah. One important element to this resolution to me was the way that it demonstrates that even in supposed blue districts, the constituents, Americans are not fans of socialism and further there's a recognition in the united states that the central planning the government ownership of the means of production has led to tyranny and brutality throughout history that's what the resolution was trying to acknowledge so even if democratic party representatives personally favor let's say more central planning uh, an expanded state they realize that it's not a winner with constituents, which is, which is exactly the standoff you refer to and why those who have a mission to create a socialist state have to use anti-democratic means to get there. What are those means, Steve? And especially in the U.S. context. Well, politicized justice. I mean, would you have uh, uh, anti uh, um, uh, Supreme Court, the, the, when the Supreme Court ruled uh, and, and said that uh, they overturned Roe versus Wade, there were demonstrations before that happened because of the leaked memo. And people went to the homes of the Supreme Court justices and they demonstrated. That violates specific statute. It's against the law. 
Did the Justice Department enforce the law? No, because they completely agree with that. So if you're on the regime side, the law means nothing. You can evade that law. But when pro-life people want to demonstrate, uh uh-uh, here comes the FBI, it's going to arrest them. So that's politicized justice. And, and, and that is the hallmark of, of socialism. And we can disagree on all kinds of things, and that's healthy. But we must agree on respecting the rules. Well, socialists don't. And therein lies the key issue. Yeah, it is. We've discussed this before, Steve. And this one that, that this issue particularly concerns me the way that there are many, often subtle means by which central planners can overturn or go against the will of the people. And this politicized justice is one where people know that if, if they take a certain position politically or speak out, they will suffer. Of course, they will respond. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a perverse incentive. So, yes, that is, that is a, a particularly troubling element. And we've all seen what happened to Donald Trump. That's just where with his with his home in Florida being invaded by the FBI. Everyone can see that was not, let's say, a neutral application of the law. It was not objective. And so now if you are a political opponent of the regime, you are in the firing line. Not everybody can see it. And that's the problem that the legacy media in the United States is partners with the Biden regime. They conspired with Biden to put him in the White House. They suppressed information. I mean, this is public now with Twitter. I mean, we knew it before anyway. But the the, the Democrat Party and the oligarchs conspired together with federal bureaucrats to suppress the, the truth that would harm Biden and anything that would help Trump. So they they intervened in democratic uh, process, and they're not interested in the democrat process. They're interested in power. That means tyranny. That means the end of the constitution. That means no due process. And 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 as you were pointing out, they have have to hide this from their own constituents. If if those people do, I mean, the majority of people, like you said, they reject socialism. What they don't understand is that they're actually supporting it by supporting Democrats. It's, it's a very tricky situation because it's almost false advertising to call the Democrat Party or the Democratic Party by its, by its uh, adjective. Yeah, I it's the same, that. Yeah, it's the same with the Liberal Party in Canada, which has basically no liberalism at all. The illiberal And party. because the... I hate, I'm not sure where the deep state is the word, but the permanent bureaucracy in the United States has shown itself to be overwhelmingly, almost 100% on the side of the Democratic Party and have, with, with a great deal of condescension and disgust towards the will of the American people. And you know this, Steve. I think you're actually in Washington, D.C. right now. It's just the culture there, unfortunately, has, has, has an arrogance towards the will of the people. Yes, that's that's entirely true, and the the uh, <clears throat> the the Democrat. I don't. I won't call them the Democratic Party because I mean, yes, it's a big D, you know, capital D. So that's its name. So it's formally the Democratic Party, but the word Democratic with a small D you know, the, the, is yes. is uh, does not apply, as you mentioned, to Democrat. I can't call it the Democratic Party. I call it the Democrat Party. Because there's nothing democratic about it. If you look at the way they ran the House under Nancy Pelosi, you look at that January 6th commission. The first time they didn't let the minority uh, leader choose uh, members of a committee. They rejected it. Pelosi rejected it. She put her own Republicans on there. Now, she knew that those Republicans hated Trump and were part of uh, her group of, of Democrats. And they pretended to be objective. There was nothing objective about it. That was a show trial. I mean, it wasn't a trial, but it was a hearing. It was a committee investigation. There was nothing serious about that. They were out to get Trump from the beginning, and they want uh, people to to believe that. You don't have to uh, be a supporter of Donald Trump to understand. They want to make it Trump, 
versus who, who whatever. But no, that is anti and un-American, the way they handled that committee. And that's what Democrats represent. Yeah. And just right now, this, this anti-socialism resolution is becoming more relevant because, of course, the GOP, the Republican Party, did get a slim majority in the House of Representatives. So therefore, they can lead all sorts of investigations. And any and they've called one of the one of the committees or one of the investigations government weaponization, or the investigation of government weaponization. So, Steve, do you want to comment on how those are going and whether that anti-socialism resolution will will rear its head again during those investigations? I suspect it will. The uh, uh, Committee on Weaponization of Government, no Democrats voted for that. And so those 109 Democrats, in effect, who voted for the anti-socialism resolution, in effect, they, they, they are saying that, that uh, Democrat, uh, it's not Democrat regime is not socialist, but mm-hmm. they don't want to investigate. Well, why don't they want to investigate it? What can, how can, can they explain that? Oh, because the Republicans are partisan, because they're going to be making things up, they're going to be ignoring evidence. Well, that's exactly precisely what the Democrats did. So they would be accusing Republicans, and they will be. They are going to demonize everybody involved. They're going to demonize the whole committee because that's what they do. And they know that they can depend on their legacy media partners to do exactly that. And so they will keep lying blatantly to the American public. So the question is, how do you get through to the public so that the public understands that every individual in the United States is at risk when arbitrary justice is applied and the Biden regime absolutely represents arbitrary justice. And the only thing that keeps it different from Venezuela or Cuba or any place like that is our two plus centuries of separation of powers and, and our constitution and our declaration of independence. And the Democrat party is trying to destroy all that. Yeah. Well, with, some, with help from some Republicans too. Yeah. The challenge is, as you know, Steve, that to us, this seems as clear, clear as day, right? It's before our eyes. And when it comes to the January 6th protesters, for example, versus black lives matters, uh, black lives matter rioters or protesters, it's night and day. Some people are getting prosecuted on how for years on end and others are not. It's clear that the regime is taking a side and applying justice in its favor, right? To, in, in, to its preferences. Now, folks, if you want to uh, learn more about this topic, Steve's latest one about this anti-socialism amendment, it is both on BizPack Review and on impunityobserver.com. The title is how the anti-socialism resolution corners the Biden regime. And Steve's got a heck of a lot more uh, in that piece. But I want to move on to his his more recent one, which ties into an article by one of our contributors, Nick Versi. And this one is, it says, "How how to save ourselves from Chinese and Democrat Party communism. That's because there's no secret the presence of China specifically via soft power in Latin America is growing all the time. It's clear. We've had a report on how Chinese financing has undermined Ecuadorian institutions, not that they were glowing to begin with, but how it is worsening them or exacerbating the problem. So, Steve, why did you you, uh, see it as so important to address this topic of Chinese expansionism in the Western Hemisphere? Well, the, the overall problem with China uh, is that, as, as I quoted the FBI from 2020 in the piece, uh, yeah. they want to replace us as the world superpower. They want to dominate the world. And their system is, is, is incompatible with liberty. So... Their presence in Latin America is, you can be sure, an uh, anti-liberty presence. Now, the way they do business is uh, they have lots of money and they use it to 
hook countries. They lend them money. They lend private companies money. What's their criteria? What are they looking for? Well, they're looking to dominate those countries. So they don't care that the country can't pay them back. No big deal. And they, they, they will uh, uh, impose conditions on these countries until these countries stand up for themselves. Now, very difficult for those countries to stand up for themselves unless they're, they're unified and without U.S. leadership. Well, the United States today is exactly the opposite. The Biden regime and its partner State Department, I say partner because State Department has its own foreign policy, they are, 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 are pushing socialism throughout Latin America. So they are actually paving the way for China to take over Latin America. Yeah, the problem is that many people don't seem to understand, and we discuss this all the time, but the U.S. State Department basically, like you said, has its own agenda, has its own mission, has its own policy. Whoever is in the Congress or the White House, they'll just, they, they have their own strategy going on. That's and correct. It's not exactly socialist necessarily. It, you might say it's progressive or socially liberal or whatever, but they're pushing the agenda that sides with Latin America's leftists. So they are aligning with the people who actually are outright socialists or Marxists. Whether, whether the, those in the State Department themselves are dyed in the wall socialists, that's, you know, it's hard to read people's minds. But the way they behave and the alignments they make or the allies they forge, that puts them on the left, left side of the Latin American political spectrum. It, it's very different. It's almost a distraction left and right. I mean, socialist or, or fascist. Look, tyranny is tyranny. Whatever your philosophy might be, if you're not free, what the hell's the difference what your philosophy is? And, and so the, the socialism that they sell because they're selling fantasies that can't, they can't deliver on, that's to hook people. That's to take power. And so the State Department is working with people who are trying to take power in an undemocratic way and to rule their countries in an undemocratic way. Tyrannies. They, the, the State Department condemns Cuba and, and Venezuela and Nicaragua, but that's just words. When it comes to action, they don't do that. So it, it doesn't really matter about the politics. They like us to go back and forth against each other, left, right, uh, but that's really not the issue. The issue is liberty and tyranny. You want to be free, you can disagree on anything. But if, if, if you don't focus on maintaining liberty, these people will take it from you. And unfortunately, our State Department is one of those who wants to take it from us. If anyone doubts this, just look at the State Department's behavior in Guatemala one example which is so petty and pathetic was the way that the, the U.S. State Department, and this is when Tommy Robinson, Tom Robinson was the uh, ambassador, they wanted to have some kind of disabled person's rights bill passed in the, Repu in the uh, Congress of Guatemala. And so Skippy Fer um, Linares, Fernando Linares, I think is his name, He's, he's, he voted against it open, openly. And so immediately they canceled his visa to travel to the United States. This is how pathetic and how involved that just because a few of these State Department officials want to support some kind of bill in the, in the co Congress of Guatemala, which has nothing to do with the United States or foreign policy, they then try to pun they then punish him right away. Well, I don't know if the, if the State Department revoked uh, for now. Okay, we've just lost Steve there. We had a story on this at the at the time. We had a story on this at the time, Steve. So I, I remember clearly what happened. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm getting a call from from from, okay. from from some spammers. Anyway, I, I turned it off. I hope it doesn't happen again. Anyway, is is <coughs> the I don't know that they uh, revoked uh, Fernando Linares's visa as a result of that. The first thing that they were upset about him with when when former Ambassador Todd Robinson uh, was uh, imposing Gloria Porras on Guatemala's uh, court of last resort, the Constitutional Court, 
Uh, Fernando Linares spoke against it, voted against it. The vote was 145 to six. He was one of the six. And then right. after that, he opposed uh, the State Department's uh, uh, constitutional changes that they were using the UNE party of, of former, uh, 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 so, well, she was the secretary, I think, uh, vice president of Socialist International, Sandra Torres. They used her party to uh, pe- uh, promote constitutional changes that would have centralized power and made it arbitrary. And Fernando was one of the leaders against that. So mm. I think it was after that that they revoked his visa. But the hey. case that you mentioned is 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 absolutely correct. What they did was they accused him of discrimination because he talked against that that proposed legislation. And the Constitution and the law are very clear. You cannot charge a member of Congress with crimes for what they say in the Congress. Yeah, well, at the, to- the time, so obviously he was already on their radar as a troublemaker in their eyes. So, yes. yeah, so Leonardo's, and, and I guess you, you like you say, you, you don't necessarily know what caused them to cancel his visa, but they did cancel it. And they he did. did. Nothing, he did nothing and, actually criminal. He just spoke his opinion in Congress. Well, if you really want to know who these people are, Fernando's 27 year old son was a member of the South Carolina National Guard, and he was about to enter uh, the army. And at 27, he suddenly died about a week after they took Fernando's visa. And he asked for special dispensation to go to his son's funeral. Denied. That is who the State Department is. These people have no mercy. They have no humanity. The only thing they want to do is impose their will on everybody else, including Americans, because one of the things I mentioned in, in, in the piece published yesterday is <clears throat> that that they <clears throat> the, the uh, State Department has been found to be funding organizations blacklisting conservative news media in the United States. Yeah, I mean, the, the idea of constitutionality has gone out the window when that sort of thing is happening. It's a joke. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, okay, yeah, this article, let's try to get back to <laughs> Chinese expansionism, though. So, as you say, if the U.S. State Department and the Biden regime are uh, siding with leftists, so as you say, people who have a tyrannical agenda naturally that plays right into the hands of the Chinese because they want, they're quite happy to work with the tyrants, let's say in Nicaragua or now in Honduras or wherever. And this has been happening now for um, many years, particularly the last 20 years. So the, it's been a, there's been a big ramp up this century of Chinese investment or engagement in Latin America. And I don't see that stopping anytime soon. Now, there are two bills in the house, as far as I know, Maybe no, it was one of them. No, in the, one's in the, in the Senate. Yeah, okay. Well, one's in the House, one's in the Senate. And they're both promoting what is called near shoring. Given the recognition that China has just too much control and not just economic control, but basically strategic or geopolitical control over the over the United States through its trade uh, behavior, that there has to be something done about this. And there are two bills promoting nearshoring, which would mean trying to find more favorable and closer allies for trade that would not place the United States in jeopardy. Do you want to clarify what's going on, Steve? Well, that's that's true, and it makes a lot of sense because we, we have an economic dependence on China that are very bad for us. We shouldn't have it. And so Latin America is there, and it's close. Why should we let a foreign hostile power Uh, take over Latin America. So we should be trading with them. We should be helping them. But instead of helping them, we're trying to turn them into tyrannies and we're protecting the tyrannies that are there. So if that bill comes to the floor of the House and the Senate, uh, if it passes, it will surely be vetoed. But you can be sure that the State Department is going to oppose it. Now, they might find some way to oppose it that makes uh, a little bit of sense. Who knows? I doubt it. 
but they will surreptitiously oppose it because if that bill were ever to become law, it would put uh, it would be at, at, at loggerheads with the State Department. And if you look at Guatemala, uh, which we were talking about, good example, they're pushing. It would make great sense for Guatemala to say, OK, we're going to go with China. There's all kinds of money. They accuse Guatemala as being corrupt. Guatemala could make a, uh, people who run the government could make a lot of money taking it from China, but they don't. They don't want it. They're one of the best friends of Taiwan. They've had great relations with Taiwan forever. So why not work with the government of Guatemala? Well, the State Department has a huge amount of criminal activity that it has to hide. And if Americans understand how criminal the State Department has been in Guatemala, they will be shocked. Members of Congress will be shocked. And it's unsustainable. We have to find a way around that. And if we don't, China's going to be taking over. Well, yes, the two bills, uh, one from Bill Cassidy, senator from Louisiana, that's the America's Act, and then Mark Green, uh, House member from Tennessee, the Western Hemisphere Nearshoring Act. And we explain these in detail on our website, impunityobserver.com. One is uh, by Steve and one is by Nick Versi. Nick focuses more on the business opportunity. Steve fo focuses more on, let's say, the political implications. Both articles give a, a, a nice overview as to what is going on with those. And I, I recommend people check out, you know, I'll, we, we share these over all our streams. So go to our social media, go to our website, and uh, we have much more detail there. Nick wrote about a 900-word piece on the topic, uh, very detailed. Now... You say, Steve, that we know these are unlikely, to say the least, to get actually passed into law. But there is still merit to proposing them, right, to setting the agenda. Do you want to clarify the merits of putting these bills forward, even if they're going to bump into stiff opposition? Well, sure. The, the, the challenge that, that uh, Republicans who believe in liberty, and you have to add that because there are some who don't, like mm -hmm. the ones who are on that January 6th committee, both of, or at least two of the principal ones are no longer there. Uh, sure. The people, people who, 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 who believe in, in, in liberty uh, <clears throat> understand that this is, this, this is a, a, a core issue. So uh, how do you get it through? You, you've got to be able to uh, get to the public. Right? The demonization but that the Biden regime uses, uh, you know, the people who run the Biden regime, that's not Joe Biden. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they, they promote demonization so that they can polarize and their partner media make sure to keep their followers in line. That's how they can lie so blatantly. How do you get around that? Well, the way that the Republicans have to do that is by informing the public. That's the purpose of these investigations. Now, they will demonize the investigations themselves and claim that this is pure politics, the same kind of thing that the Democrats do. Well, the Republicans have to play by certain rules. They don't have any choice and they don't have media to support them when they're violating the law and when they're lying to the public. They'll get exposed because the, the non-legacy media isn't going to cover for the Republicans if they're corrupt. And, and, and the legacy media will never tell you the truth about the Democrats when they're corrupt, which is all the damn time just about. And so how do you get this to the public? You have to, the Republicans have to propose legislation, even though it gets, uh, it's not passed into law, so that by the time the election comes at the end of next year, uh, there'll be a record that the public will know. This is what Republicans will do if they get returned to power and and that message better be restore liberty yeah and specifically with the the near shoring bills ideally since there's there's not necessarily a social element to me these shouldn't be partisan topics that a lot of democrat members could easily support these and i don't see how their constituents would go against them well, that's right. And the reason that they they become partisan is the strategy of of polarization. I mean, this goes back a long, long way. I mean, it goes back a century when when uh, Marx's uh, uh, 
uh, confrontation between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat didn't work. They had to find other ways to provoke uh, confrontation. So that's the key element in taking over societies. So they demonize people so so that, uh, for instance, uh, Donald Trump's a racist. Donald Trump has, there's nothing racist about him. There's so much evidence that he is absolutely not a racist. You could say anything else you want about Trump. I'm not talking about that. And, and you don't have to say he's all good or he's all bad. Let's talk about what his faults are. Let's talk about what his good points are. Well, he's not a racist. And yet they brand him as a racist. And, and they say that all Republicans are racist. White supremacy, that there's systemic racism. Why do they do that? To divide the country. Black Lives Matter. All right. Of course. All right. So black people need to be treated equally. Of course. All Americans agree with that. But Black Lives Matter doesn't represent black people. That's a scam. And if you don't believe that, take a look at today's Washington Times. There are a couple of, of, of Cuban expatriates who write about that, that, <clears throat> that, that the Cuban regime is really anti-black. So here's Black Lives Matter who praised Fidel Castro, who eulogized him and said he's a model. The guy was a racist. So the Black Lives Matter people are communists before they're black. It's that simple. Yeah, I 100% I agree with that, that they're placing ideology before the the actual outcomes or well-being of uh, blacks in the United States. And Cuba is a prison island, a communist nation, unfortunately. And that places the largely mulatto population under that rule. The article by... Nick Versi, which focuses on the economic potential of nearshoring, particularly in Guatemala, is why Guatemala is crucial to U.S. nearshoring. And his, the subtitle is Loyal Ally Can Be Bulwark Against Advancing China. This is a great piece. And, yeah, so Nick also notes that Guatemala meets all the criteria in these bills. No, and then it's, it has worked closely with the United States to uh, resist illegal immigration, human trafficking, resist narco trafficking. And as you noted earlier, Steve, Guatemala is a staunch ally of Taiwan. So in a great position, we have really raced through the half hour, man, this, these live streams get quicker and quicker. So, <laughs> <laughs> but so folks, please go to impunityobserver.com. Follow us on our various social media feeds. You can also get a monthly e-newsletter, which is handy. We, ha I give a commentary on all our content. We have a, and it'll go out, this week because it's just the end of the month in the February right now. I give a commentary on all our content and we have a, all our media appearances, all the content in one place each month, just a simple email, a great place to stay up to date on geopolitical matters at the nexus of Latin and Anglo America. Steve, any final remarks before I let you go? Well, just that uh, people should keep their eye on the real issues, Liberty, versus tyranny you have to identify tyrants those are people that don't believe in the democratic process now they talk about it they claim they do but you have to see past those words and you have to look at what they actually do but they want everybody to be totally partisan you're on one side you're on the other side and that is never a good thing an independent goes wherever uh, makes sense. But the issues that, that, that have to unify us are the issues of, is the issue of preserving liberty. We all have to get the word out. This is a tyrannical regime. The only reason that they're not as, as bad as some of the real tyrannies of the world is that they still have to come up against U.S., tradition, separation of power, rule of law. They can't do anything they want, but they want to, and they will if we let them. So we need to all recognize that, and we need to get together and, and defeat this tyranny, and then we can resume normal democratic argument among ourselves. But we need to be free to be able to do that. Yeah, and just as, as Steve noted, a lot of these dictatorships, still pretend to have some kind of democracy. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to process, but 
we have, for example, a review just out today or yesterday on what's going on in Nicaragua. And the review by uh, Sebastian Diaz or Andres Sebastian Diaz, our, our colleague in Ecuador, writes documentary pulls back curtain on dictatorship in Nicaragua. And it's, it's Duele Respirar or Hurts to Breathe. This is an important film. Someone went basically undercover into Nicaragua and recorded what was going on and showed the truth. So that's another, it's our latest piece. Steve, yo, you want to say something, mate? Yeah. It, it, well, one of my articles, I don't remember which one, I think it was the socialism. Yeah, it was the socialism article, uh, the socialist resolution. Uh, Ariel Montoya, a uh, Nicaraguan in exile living in Miami, said that the United States continues to be the major trading partner of Nicaragua. So are they really serious about bringing down that regime? No, obviously not. The State Department supports it. They say one thing and do another thing, which is typical of tyrants. Folks, until next month, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching this video. Thanks for all your support. Please do subscribe and give us your feedback. Steve, good to see you, mate. Talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks, Ernest.